Is this something that would have been served to Jefferson and Washington by their enslaved chefs? Absolutely. Hercules and Hemings were foundational to the foods that we love today. When you understand your history mm -hmm. and understand where you come from, that mm -hmm. understanding gives you purpose. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Michelle Norris. I'm an opinion columnist for the Washington Post and I hope you are as excited as I am for our next conversation. I'm about to introduce our guest for today, Stephen Satterfield. He's the host of the Netflix series, High on the Hog, and Dr. Jessica B. Harris, whose book by the same title was the inspiration for this series. Welcome to you both. Oh, thanks. How are you? Good. I hope everyone who's watching had a good breakfast and a hearty lunch because we're going to spend the next half hour talking about food. And if you're if you haven't had a good meal today, you're certainly going to want to run on the other side of this and get one. <laughs> Thank you so much for this this series, for educating us, for elevating us. Um, for nourishing us with this series. I really enjoyed watching every minute of this. And um, Dr. Harris, I want to begin with you and the title of the book, High on the Hog. That is a term that is always referred to the better pieces of meat that you could find on the hog, on the pig. Um, traditionally, the more expensive cuts um, that the richest would necessarily eat, which meant that the people who sometimes are featured in this series would not have access to that. But why did you decide to title your book, High on the Hog, and then the, the, the series eventually taking that name as well? Well, originally, my understanding of High on the Hog is the same as everybody else's. But then at some later point in time, I actually was reading a book of plantation humor that was the sort of self-deprecating humor that enslaved mm -hmm. African Americans had on their own. And there was one particular joke that resonated and it was about John the trickster who always could get over on old master. And John got over on old master because he got hogs of his own and the master didn't know about it. And so the, you know, cut to the chase, don't tell the long hairy dog story is that he says to the master, I am eating you know, Midland and bacon and pork chops and ham, I am eating higher on the hog now. And so the light bulb went off for me and it's like, yes, that desire to eat higher on the hog is basic, I think, to all people. There was a line in the series that really struck with, stuck with me, the, the notion that the foods that now join us came with us. And that seems like it it encapsulates the, the the it captures the purpose of this journey and the purpose of this series. What Dr. Harris got you started on this line of research? Why did you start <laughs> looking at culinary traditions and the history of African American cuisine? Oh my lord! I you know I don't even remember what got me really started on it because you've been doing this a while. I've been doing this for almost, well, uh, probably a good 40 years and maybe longer than that. Um, but, um, you know, I come by this gray hair for a reason. I um, was working as travel editor at Essence back in the 1970s and started tasting foods and started making connections. And then those connections eventually led to my beginning to think about how those connections took place and what would have started those connections. And obviously the transatlantic slave trade is a large part of what started those connections. And then the next thing I know, you know, I'm kind of 11 books in and it's like, well, maybe I should write something that's a narrative about that. <laughs> that guy on the hall. Stephen, the transatlantic slave trade had an incredible impact on American cuisine. Many of the things that we eat actually came with those who made that middle passage. Could you just help the audience understand that? Because for a lot of people, this will be revelatory. People don't understand that many of the things that they see at the county fair, at the grocery store, at the holiday dinner originated in another continent.
Stephen, I think I think you might be muted. Okay, how's this? There we go. Okay, I've done this before. Um, <laughs> one of one of the things um, that I love so much about Dr. J's work is, um, as she just described, the way in which she she came into it, which is through the perspective of travel. Um, and it has really informed the way that I think about food in that I always talk about it and think about it in terms of migration. Food is um, fundamentally a, a migration story. Um, it is the migration of, of people, of, of plants, of animals, and uh, notably um, intellectual capital that, that comes with people. And so, um, as we see in episode two of High on the Hog, um, with uh, Africans being brought uh, to this this nation for their agricultural acumen um, as rice farmer from the rice coast of Africa, um, is just one of many examples um, in which the foods that we eat on a daily basis themselves have a story that is rooted in migration. What are examples of some of the other foods that made that journey through the Middle Passage and are now just part of our regular diet? <laughs> kind of sometimes well, depends on where you're living. Go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's really true. I mean, some of the um, example, like the most prominent example, of course, um, is okra that is also given in um, that first episode, um, watermelon um yams so we see many many foods um that are part of the african diasporic story um but really more broadly part of uh this this human story and human project um as we've all been to some degree or another part of our own migration story the series was masterful in blending the sobering realizations about slavery and enslavement and in, in Black history with some of the more uplifting aspects of the African-American story and traditions in America. Um, I want to ask each of you, what was the most profound realization that you made? Because you've both been on this journey for a while. Doctor, uh, if I can call you Dr. J also, uh, <laughs> you have written, <laughs> you've written, I can't, I can't help myself there. You've written 11 books. Uh, Stephen, you have been someone who's called yourself an origin forager, um, have been doing this work through Whetstone Magazine, yet I got the sense in watching this that even though you've been long at this game, that you both made profound realizations. If you'd each share perhaps one of those realizations with us. Dr. J, you want to go first? Well, actually, no, but I will. <laughs> Um, I think, I don't know, I mean, I feel like for me, what, one of the things that I thought was astounding and astonishing was to look at and to notice the way that these things are being continued, to look at the, um, the lines that, that are really unending of a lot of these traditions, the way that they have been taken up and taken on by generation after generation is one of those things that I think my realization is link in the chain. You know, I am a link in the chain and the chain is ongoing and all of that is good. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Yeah, I think that's a slightly more articulate version of what I'm thinking which is that um, the most profound realization for me came in just being in the physical space um, of the communities that um, we're referring to, these sort of descendants, um, these, these culture keepers. Um, and, you know, to some degree, I uh, include myself humbly in that work and tradition. Um, but it's one thing to to read about it in in the text, um, for instance, like High on the Hog, um, or to even be aware of it tangentially through this, um, you know, very social and sharing and digital culture that we live in. But there is no substitute for actually sharing space with the communities who have themselves protected and guarded um, communities and cultures. Uh, oftentimes under improbable circumstances and conditions um, so that we can still celebrate these cultures, our food cultures and, and ways of life. Um, so I just had such a profound um, 
reverence and, 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 and humbling for just what has been required for these traditions to endure over time. I can't pass a catering truck on the road or see a wedding taking place now that we're allowed to do that kind of thing again um, and gather again. But any place where caterers are doing work, serving large amounts of food to large amounts of people and not think of your series now. And not understand that the, even the word catering, the notion of catering came from um, people who were descendants of the enslaved in Philadelphia. Can you explain that story for people who perhaps have not yet seen the series and help us understand why it's so important for us to understand these origin stories? Stephen, I'll yield that one to you. Yeah, so um, we see, uh, we learn about the Dutrell family. Um, in Philadelphia um, through Lauren, who is a descendant of a very uh, prestigious catering family in Philadelphia. Um, and it's really, um, I think, so fitting for um, what the aim is for this work and, and for this material um, is really about a historical reorientation um, that appropriately places and centers the contributions of Black people, not just in this culinary story, but but in the the, the story of the United States. And so, um, oftentimes, uh, catering was one of the very few avenues for entrepreneurship um, for uh, newly free, or in some cases even um, and and cooking and selling their food for for folks who were enslaved. And so our relationship with the, the kitchen as a people in, in this African-American context um, really is a story that is as old as our arrival um, on, on this continent. And yet the ways in which we think about that influence have been really marginalized and sort of reduced to this very broad thing that we call soul food. Um, and yet, even uh, you know, centuries after after these uh, catering entrepreneurs in Philadelphia, we know as as black people um, growing growing up in the U.S., we all have catering entrepreneurs in our families, right? Often for the same reasons that the barrier for entry um, is much lower and allows us um, to take these skills and traditions that are parts of our families, parts of our kind of innate knowledge in, in some cases, um, and be able to create economic opportunity for ourselves. So um, it is a wonderful tradition um, that I think we all kind of, uh, as Black people, felt um, connected to, but uh, in learning the origins uh, instills us with a sense of pride, you know, in, in our influence um, in, in this culture. If you take a poll of America's most beloved dishes, uh, the food we just love most, <laughs> macaroni and cheese is always on that list. Whether you're from the South, whether you're from the, the Pacific Northwest, whether you're in the Midwest, everybody loves macaroni and cheese, but not everybody can actually perfect macaroni and cheese. As we know, there's usually in families a discussion about who's going to cook the macaroni and cheese to make sure that they that they get it right. There is a, a scene that is, is so memorable um, in one of the earlier uh, episodes, which takes place at Monticello, um, and it's someone preparing macaroni and cheese from a recipe that goes back centuries. Can we just stop and, and let's take a, a look at this clip before we continue? James Hemmings would have been my great, 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 great uncle. His brother Peter was my great, great, great grandfather. Fine. And so I feel a special relationship to this mac and cheese. Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. Rightfully so. Yeah. so you must have grown up eating mac and cheese. Well, sure, we all did, didn't we? Yeah, we all did, right? Yeah. yeah. And so um, how did it feel once you realized that you were a descendant of the person or the family that helped popularize this dish in the US? Well. First of all, I didn't grow up with that knowledge. I didn't learn that until recently. And now that I know that, I'm wondering where my royalties are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're all wondering that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and beyond that, um, listen, it's really um, an honor. I'm lucky enough to know that history. But 
every black American has something like that in their backgrounds. They just don't know it. Mm -hmm. So I'm honored, I'm privileged, and I can't wait to taste this mac and cheese. If you will hand me our little tasting dishes, oh we will indulge ourselves. It's a wonderful scene, and she's a descendant of the Hemings, and that, of course, is a family related to Sally Hemings and, and a, a woman who we now know much more about because of the scholars like Annette Gordon-Reed and others who have researched um, her, uh, I was going to use the word relationship, but that's kind of an elastic word to describe um, her relationship with uh, with uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and um, and their children and now the descendants. The scene is so emblematic of the tone of the entire program, a dish that Americans love so much, clearly rooted in slavery. Dr. Harris, what was it like to research the origins of this this dish and to meet the people whose ancestors created, perfected, served this dish to dignitaries who would visit Monticello? Well, actually, researching the dish was wonderful, and I owed much to Annette Gordon-Reed. Um, I unfortunately have not yet met the person who appears in the video. I was not there when it was taped, but I look forward to meeting her. The person that I do know is Dr. Lenny Sorensen, who is the person who prepared the mac and cheese, and she were many, many years was the resident African-American scholar at Monticello. And so I've spoken with her a lot about that. But I think that the whole notion of just this history and how so much of our history is actually hidden in plain sight, um, the a musical Hamilton talks about being in the room where it happened. Um, we have for generations and generations and generations in this country been in the room where it happened, but often never acknowledged as having been in the room. And so I think that's one of the things that I take away from that wonderful clip. Were you surprised when Dr. Sorensen prepared the mac and cheese at how simple its preparation was, because it's become something in American traditions that is now much more five different cheeses and bechamel sauce and uh, panko crumbs on the top. But this was a, a very simple rendering of that dish. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just delighted to be in the company of, of Dr. Sorensen, honestly. Um, as Dr. J alluded to, you know, her scholarship um, and sort of the Appalachian mid-Atlantic region um, has been very inspiring for me um, in my career. Um, and I think in terms of simplicity, I don't know if I was surprised as much as sort of amused and delighted by it, you know, um, a really good reminder um, around origins, around um, availability and seasonality. Um, you start to realize that a lot of our food today is perhaps needlessly um, complex. Uh, so I, I really sort of reveled in how simple it was. You know, with the deaths of people like Edna Williams years ago and Leah Chase more recently, is it more important to actually forage for these stories right now? Because many of the people who can link us to our past are, are leaving and joining the ancestors. Dr. J? Uh, I cannot second that thought or, you know, trumpet that more loudly. I think it's very, very important. While I think on one hand, it is extraordinary to look toward the youth who are maintaining some of these traditions. At this particular junction and at this particular time, it's almost Sankofa, you know, go back and fetch it. Find mm -hmm. where you're from so you know where you're going. And that means talk to the people who were here, who were doing it, who who knew them. I had the the distinct pleasure of knowing both Edna Lewis and Leah Chase. I knew Leah Chase much better. Um, but that that whole idea of that connection, of of learning from those people, of talking to those people, of of knowing those people, of of understanding and maintaining the continuity of the work of those people is really kind of very important, particularly now that we are just beginning to find out things 
I mean, as uh, as we learned and as you spoke of earlier, the Dutre family in uh, in Philadelphia and their whole catering concern and the whole idea that the catering goes back to actually a man named Bogle, who invented the idea of having kind of portable butlers or rentable butlers. And so you could have a butler even if you couldn't necessarily afford to have one on full time staff and that catering grew out of that is is astounding. And he was, Mr. Bogle was so renowned that uh, Biddles, and we all know the name Biddles, there were the Biddles, and in my childhood, there were the Biddle Dukes and all of that. Um, Biddle put, penned an ode to Bogle. He actually wrote a poem to Mr. Bogle. Mr. Bogle was so famous and so necessary to the working of households in Philadelphia. And so all of that, I mean, how many people have uncles, great uncles, um, grandfathers who were probably only called cooks, mm -hmm. but who and hold kitchens and today would have been called with luck, would have been called chefs. Um, and they never talk about it because it was deemed domestic work and it wasn't considered, you know, white collar work, just something folks did. And so to go back, I think one of the things that the series for me sort of pouts and, and trumpets is, and not just for African-Americans, but for everyone, find out where you're from. Mm -hmm. Talk to your people. You know, who are your people? Who, who are the folks that, you know, whose backs you stand on? Because the bottom line is none of us would be here unless somebody came before us. So that is important. And I think that that's one of my big takeaways from the series. And food is so much a part of that story, yet everything is digitized now. I know that every time I find one of the recipe cards where my mother wrote out in her perfect penmanship, her recipe for lemon cake, her recipe for Laura's pound cake, her recipe for sweet potato pie, her recipe for the rum sauce, which not too much. It's OK if you sip a little, but not too much there either. You know, and she, you know, and I, and I love to see that. But we don't do that anymore because everything's digitized. Should we do that? Because often we learn how to cook by watching the people we love. But should we be writing this down or documenting it? film or in some way so that it's tangible and that it can be cherished and also passed down well i mean i think we all walk around with these little you know we have our documentable things we all walk around with movie cameras in our pockets take a picture uh write it down if you can if you want to but ultimately um the technology may be more in our favor african americans are not necessarily people of the written word, people of the book. We are people of the word for certain, but our words are often oral. And so as people with deep oral traditions, perhaps some of the better ways to maintain those traditions and to document those traditions is, is visually, using video, using a camera. Um, you can then do both, but certainly do something. We have a question from uh, audience member Sarah Anderson in Massachusetts. Uh, Stephen, she wants to know if given more time, what other countries beside Benin in West Africa would you visit to pinpoint the roots of other food that are part of the African diaspora? Um, I want to answer this question by... Um, sort of not answering if, if you'll pardon me um you know of with with my work in at whetstone um we look at food origins as a means of reclamation um and so we really believe that um all of the ways in which marginalized people have been erased from history um food gives us a way to talk about that um that oftentimes polite society does not um, and one of the ways that we describe this phenomenon is to say, whoever tells the story owns the story uh, as a means of explaining the power dynamic or rather imbalance that is perpetuated uh, in narrative erasure. 
And so, you know, beginning in Benin, which is where we start off um, in Dr. J's text, um, is not actually my choice. Uh, it's it's based on it's based on the book and the text, um, and it's also based on decisions that were made by the creative team um, of Fabian Toback, Karis Jagger, Roger Ross Williams, the director, Shoshana Guy, the showrunner. Oh, um, so even though I am the the host, um, those choices are are not mine alone. But I do feel that from an origin perspective, um, almost anywhere you go, there is uh, a, a story to be told um, about the foodways from that place. You you listed a, a bunch of names, starting with Roger Ross Williams, um, who's the director. You had a predominantly black production team. Um, why was that important, and what difference did it make? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to answer that. Dr. J, do you want to say something before, though? No, no. I was going to add to the previous question, but we're Oh, well, please do, and then we'll come back. We'll come back to oh, that. Oh, no, no, no. I would just say that in terms of the food, first of all, I kind of am the person who suggested Benin and, and sort of insisted on it simply because of its position in the transatlantic slave trade. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say equally, we could take any number of the countries as you go down the coast, Senegal, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, Nigeria, Togo, arguably, Cote d'Ivoire. But if you take that whole Western part all the way down to, you know, um, Cameroon and beyond Cameroon into Angola, you begin to see where people were essentially points of departure, where people were shipped, Mm -hmm. if you will, from. And so all of those places are places that have bedrock food cultures that in their individual ways contribute. Um, you know, what what we see a lot of Benin, we see a fair amount of Senegal, Ghana, it depends on different time frames and of course mm-hmm. different places. We're talking about this in the United States context, but this uh this journey exists in the hemispheric context. It's not just the United States, it's Brazil, it's the Caribbean, it's Peru, it's, you know, arguably Argentina and Uruguay, where nobody would believe it, but it's true, and so on and so forth. So that was what I just wanted to add to that. Uh, I hear, it sounds like I hear a sequel, uh, a a second (laughs) season, perhaps, coming on. for the uh, the question that I asked earlier, the, since you had a predominantly black production team, um, the difference that that made and why was that important? Um, I think it's hugely important. Um, I think it's why the show had the impact that it did. Um, it's why I was excited about the opportunity. You know, I really think that there is a an incredible quality. Um, that is not often seen in in media broadly, food media specifically, of this sort of uh, diasporic conversation convening. Um, and in other words, the ways in which viewers have mostly experienced um, food television or food travel uh, through television is a uh, a host who is oftentimes a white man um, in another part of the world where the show uh, is about their experience there to this culture. Whereas what what High on the Hog offers um, in having a a black uh, production team based on black text with a black face at the forefront of it is really allows for uh, an emotional connection and sensitivity with the material that is often absent uh, in in the retelling of these stories, and what is lost in that space, in that absence, um, is really, I think, the the emotional intelligence and sensitivity that is derived from the lived experience of a certain um, you know racial, in this case, group, um, to be able to understand opportunities to show intimacy, um, to show spaciousness and silence. Um, and so I really feel that it came through in the final product. I think it's the intangible thing that people say that it's different and they don't understand why. Um, I believe that is what they're experiencing. And if I may Stephen add, Sat, go ahead. If I just may add one thing, 
Um, there is a Nigerian proverb that says, when the tale of the hunt is written by the lion, it will be a very different tale. So I think we are actually seeing a version of the tale of the hunt written by the lion. Right, right. This has been a delicious conversation, but unfortunately we are out of time. So um, I just want to say thank you very much to Dr. Jessica B. Harris and Stephen Satterfield. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thanks to both of you. My thank pleasure. You, I'm a, thank you. This uh, conversation certainly left me hungry, and I hope that you will find the series and take a look. Um, I also hope that you will join Washington Post Live tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for a conversation with Republican Congressman John Curtis of Utah. He's also the chair of the new Conservative Climate Caucus. You can always head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find out more information about upcoming programs. I'm Michelle Norris. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.